Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this webinar and book presentation on the volume Stanislavski and Pedagogy. It's this volume here. My name is Stefan Aquilina, and I'm an associate professor of theater studies at the University of Malta and editor in chief of the Stanislavski Studies Journal. I would like, first of all, to introduce two colleagues who are with us tonight, namely Professors Jonathan Pitches and Paul Fryer. Together, we form the directorship of the Stanislavski Research Center. Um, I'm sure that the center would be familiar with many of you, but the center carries out a lot of research surrounding Stanislavski and his legacy in contemporary theater, including the Stanislavski and book series. It's part of the research that we carry out, which is the series overall edited by Paul. Jonathan and Paul will give us a context first by speaking about the center and the book series, after which we will then go into the presentation about Stanislavski and pedagogy. Please feel free to put any questions in the Q&A section or the chat really at the bottom of your screen. And feel free to do this at any point in the, uh, in the webinar, in the session. We will get then to these questions at the end of the, of the presentation, at the end of the session. So Jonathan first, please, and then Paul. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, very warm welcome to this, this event. I have to say I'm super excited. When this arrived in the post a few weeks ago, I dived into it and consumed it voraciously. Um, so it's wonderful to be at this at this event and to to hear colleagues' thoughts about it. Um, just a few very very simple observations about the Stanislavski Research Centre. I've dropped the link of that centre into the chat if you don't know about our our operations. As Stefan said, um, it's co-directed by Paul and Stefan, and I'm a deputy director of the centre, and we split its location across Malta. Uh, and Leeds University, where, where I'm based. It's really a kind of hub of so many of the things that are represented in the, the context of this event. Um, we hold lectures, workshops, we do study days, symposia, um, and during the pandemic became particularly active, I think, in the online space. And much of that really quite innovative thinking around Stanislavski is now leaking very productively uh, into the Stanislavski and series, and Paul will talk about that. I just want to pull out a few highlights very briefly. The first is the S word, the uh, annual lecture lecture um, uh, conference, rather um, that uh, Bella and Paul founded in 2015. Last year we were in Prague for Stanislavski's last words. This year. Uh, there have been two events, one in London and one in Athens. Athens just coming up, I think, next week uh, on the director, teacher, pedagogue. Um, and then next year, um, not to, to spare David Shirley's blushes, uh, we'll be in Perth at WAPA to look at Stanislavski in place. Um, Stefan mentioned the, uh, the journal, which, of course, he's chief editor of, uh, and uh, very much uh, invite potential contributions to that to that journal now uh, getting significant uplift in downloads I understand um, and then one other thing just to point out is the Stanislavski here today now resource that I know has been uh, the the subject of a great deal of industry from colleagues in this call and way beyond as well producing some fantastic video resources on Stanislavski and really kind of nailing the contemporaneity of the thinking that goes on uh, in this in this network and through this center. So drop in there, drop into the lobby and see how we've organized those video resources. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to the conversation and uh, over to Paul. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk just for a couple of minutes about this new book series, Stanislavski and, which we're here to partially uh, to celebrate this evening. We began work on this two years ago. I can hardly believe that those two years have gone by so quickly. Uh, and the original idea was that we would produce six titles in this first block. Uh, we're just about to publish the third one. And the remaining three in that first block will come out um, over the next year. We will then move on to a second block of six. And we'll start work on those in spring of 24. 
So this will keep us going certainly over the next uh, two to three years. We had two objectives when we uh, started this series. The first one was to focus very, very clearly on Stanislavski's work seen in the context of issues of contemporary significance. What we wanted to do was not to be, in broad senses, too historical in our view. Nothing at all wrong with that. Believe me, I'm a huge supporter of that. But in this particular series, we want to look at what is happening now and perhaps to speculate what may be happening in the near future. The second thing we wanted to do was encourage new scholarship. Again, we hugely appreciate the work of established scholars who, who have been working with um, Stanislavski Research Center now for many years. But what we wanted to do was mix up that established scholarship with writers who could present their new voices. And therefore, we've been looking for people and encouraging people to take part in this who may have never published in this area before and indeed may have not have even considered publishing in this kind of area. We're very keen to maintain that link between theory and practice, which is what the S word is all about and which Bella and I felt so very strongly about from the beginning of that project. And all of our topics begin with an event of some kind. It might be a webinar, it might be a study day, it might be a one day symposium, but the idea is to have something live which brings people together. And one of the hidden advantages of that has been, it identifies people who we didn't know anything about and people who've got something really interesting and really fresh to say. We want to appeal to a very wide readership and our books are designed to be just as useful to a student at school who's doing an essay for their A-level theatre studies, to someone who's researching a PhD, and everything in between. And of course, those people who are just really interested in theatre. The last thing I wanted to say really is that our books don't conform to any kind of pattern or template, and that's a deliberate decision. Um, I can only give you an example of that because I was talking to an editor about it today who said to me, how long do you want the chapters to be? And my answer to that question is as long as they need to be, because sometimes some of our writers can say what they need to say very, very adequately in 2000 words. Other people need five, six or 7000 words. So you won't find that kind of conformity in our books. You'll also find people approaching their subjects in very different, and very original and very innovative ways. And we positively encourage that. So very finally, uh, before we hand over to our contributing authors, I'd like to thank and to congratulate Stefan and his authors for the wonderful achievement of producing this book, Stanislavski and Pedagogy, which is the very first in our brand new series, Stanislavski and. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So we can start the presentation on the uh, on the book and I have a PowerPoint to help me go through some of the points that I would like to share with you. Uh, so I would like first and foremost to take you a little bit back in, in years when I first encountered Stanislavski. And I, my first experience of Stanislavski was in a bookshop. So basically, I was 17 years old and quite by chance finding myself on the stage and actually enjoying being on the stage, enjoying the thrill of the stage. And, you know, wanting to become a little bit better at it. And being a bookish person, I did what many people would do. I went into a bookshop and I searched for a book about acting. This being a generalist bookshop, it only had one volume, an actor prefers. Now, of course, I was 17. What, I, what was I looking for? I was looking for a manual, no other way around it. I wanted a book which would tell me how to act, do this and do that. And instead, I found a journey. A journey. I found the journey of a young actor situating himself in a life of art. With more study, with more reading about Stanislavski, I came to realize that this journey is a pedagogical journey. 
a journey there for which marries together technique, skill, and exercises with ethics, research, and the creation of new knowledge. Now, these, of course, are, this is Stanislavski's story, the one in an actor's work, but the cornerstones of this journey, of this story, are all evident in the book, evident in different ways and to different extents, but definitely evident in the book. I don't think that I was interested in summarizing the system with Stanislavski and pedagogy, nor was I interested in developing a training program which somebody might use, like a full training program. But what I was interested in was to find scholars, teachers, and practitioners who are themselves journeying with Stanislavski. The idea of a journey is something which is engaging, which is fun, but something which has, you know, is difficulty, something which needs some exploration. It's not always quite sure when you are arriving or where you are arriving. So it's this idea of journeying with Stanislavski that I was really, really interested in. And it is this that helped me, that pushed me to make contact with a series of scholars, teachers, and practitioners. Now, my presentation today will be divided in three, or rather this webinar will be divided in three. First, I will speak about pedagogy and training and why I chose the term pedagogy as my main frame. Then I will speak about some pedagogical points that are arising from the essays. And then I will give the floor to the authors who will each give a statement um, who will each present their essays, the objectives behind their essays, and the results emerging from their work. Of course, I would like to thank the authors for their input in the book and for their time tonight. And I would also like to introduce them here. So from the University of Central Florida, we have Julia Lissengarden and Christopher Nies. Bella Merlin, is from the University of California, Riverside. David Shirley, who is based at the Western Australian Academy of Performing Arts in Perth. Eileen Hanselar, who is a freelance performer and actor tutor based in Belgium. And Mario Frendo, who's also from the University of Malta. Two authors, unfortunately, could, it, could not be with us tonight. Hilary Halba from the University of Otago, New Zealand and John Gillett, who is a freelance director and actor tutor based in London, and they send their apologies. Though jo John also sent me a statement, which I will read out a little bit later. Now, let's start. Pedagogy or training, why did I focus? Why did I choose the term pedagogy as my framing term rather than training? And I had a few reasons why I did so. So, first of all, I always felt that the term training carries strong, not only, but carries strong historical connotations. So, for example, Alison Hodge in her introduction says, actor training came to be central to theatrical innovation in the 20th century, marking actor training as an important historical contributor of early 20th century theater. While, as even Paul said, rather than, you know, having a lot of historical input in the book, what I was more interested in was in contemporary adaptations, in contemporary voices. The second point is that I always felt that pedagogy is a broader term, broader than training. And I was very keen to explore this broadness. Now, in fact, some scholarship seems to be more content, happier, more content with the opposite of broadness, what Frank Camilleri refers to as essentialization. Essentialization as an attempt to distill what is essential in a discourse about training, and hence about the activity of training itself. And I always felt that this essentialization very often boils down to an understanding of training as a skills-based transmission of technique. And why am, I, why am I emphasizing skill based, skills based transmission of techniques? If we read, for example, Richard Schechner, this is how he defines training. Training as that phase of performance process where specific skills are learned. Or 
um, Paul Elaine and Jan Harvey again define training as skills needed to make communication clearer and the experience easier for the performer. Now, as I said, I wanted to look beyond an essentialized skill-based understanding of training. So let's take Ian Watson. Ian Watson says that where education tends to the global, training is specific. Where the former prepares for life, the latter has a vocational and or craft bent that focuses on mastering and applying a specific set of, here this again, skills. Now, of course, when Ian Watson says that education tends to be global, he's not referring to some one size fits all mentality, but what I think he's referring to is the potential which education and pedagogy have in questioning the slash in those, um, in those wordings at the bottom of your screen, questioning the binaries of student teacher, transmission reception, classroom life, and skills attitudes. Pedagogy blends these categories because it does not predicate generalized and blind application of learning processes. Remember, in fact, how Wari Stanislavski himself was uh, that his system would turn into a dry acting manual. Pedagogy rather underscores specific learning situations, each governed by a particular set of economic, social, cultural, political, and human circumstances. The third point why I chose pedagogy uh, is that I was following Stanislavski's own words. In fact, Maria Shevstova says that Stanislavski very rarely used the word training itself to opt instead for the word development. So even I feel Stanislavski was pushing um, in this direction with his own choice of words. The fourth point why I chose pedagogy, and perhaps the most important, is that it allows me to foreground the role of the students, the role of the trainee. Now, we often see this in corporate announcements. For example, training offered by, uh, by Mr. X or by Mrs. Y. The idea here would be that, you know, there's an expert who is coming with some expert skill and the trainee is expected to assimilate these skills. Pedagogy, on the other hand, reminds us that that transmission is always two ways. That transmission is two ways between A and B, between transmitter and trainee and receiver, especially when it is three points, especially when the teacher is himself or himself, herself undergoing a learning experience. When transmission is treated as an instance of knowledge exchange, and when the receiver actively impacts on the transmission activity through the skills, experience, intentions, and backgrounds that they bring into the experience. This is perhaps a good place to start moving towards the essays when we are speaking about the role of the students. So for example, Bella Merlin in her essay speaks about the, uh, and gives value to the, te the technological knowledge which students brought to their online project, which then she will be speaking about in her intervention. Or for instance, David Shirley speaks in his essay about the experiment of Hagen Online that was engaging and revealing only thanks to the dedicated work of a highly motivated and committed group of students. And so, what I'm emphasizing here is that teacher-student involvements remain at the core of pedagogy and the pedagogical processes in the book. In fact, this is how they are treated by Mario Frendo in his essay. I quote, pedagogy is the transmission of concrete and practical ideas of work, which require a process of learning to be acquired by the student and where both the pedagogue and the student are agents in the process of generating new knowledge. And ultimately, I think it is here that I locate the crucial differences, difference, at least in the context of this book between pedagogy and training. 
That is, pedagogy is not simply the transmission of skill from A to B, but rather a shared process aimed at creating new knowledge and strategies in answer to ever shifting work scenarios. A process which needs both pedagogue and training or student to work together. Of course, when we are talking about new knowledge, we are talking about research. And that is how Stanislavski treated pedagogy some 100 years ago, especially when he was working in his studios. Now, in the second part of my presentation, I will be speaking a little bit about some points about Stanislavski and pedagogy arising from the book. And the first one is the existence, the uh, presence of vertical and horizontal approaches to vector training. These are two ways of relating, of conceptualizing vector training or pedagogical processes. So, for instance, in the book, it's very clear that all essays adopt Stanislavski as a very clear vertical kernel. They go into depth in Stanislavski's work and often in one element of Stanislavski's work. So very clearly the emphasis, the focus, the vertical kernel is Stanislavski. But then this verticality, this vertical line is balanced by a horizontal openness. A horizontal openness that allows Stanislavski to mix, that allows Stanislavski to get hybridized with other practitioners or with other realities. And these practitioners or these realities can be very diverse. They can be other practitioners from his own, from Stanislavski's own acting tradition. So, for example, we have people like Hegel, Meister, and Mikhail Chekhov being referenced a number of times in the book. We could also have a sense of hybridity, a sense of mixing Stanislavski with practitioners outside of the Stanislavski acting tradition, like in Johnston. This hybridity could also be cultural, such as when concepts from the, the Maori world are hybridized with active analysis. Or this hybridity could also be cross-disciplinary, when we have in Eileen's essays considerations from tango and again how they mix and how they help us to, um, to relate, to inform Stanislavski's approaches. What I feel, however, is that this hybridity of Stanislavski reminds us of the ten, of reminds us of two points. The first is the tendency among practitioners to synthesize rather than compartmentalize their own formative experiences. So it's not a question that it's a question of books on the shelf, and you use these techniques. Okay, it's more a question of these practitioners mixing and synthesizing and putting together mixing together Stanislavski and other practices. The other point, which is a point which I particularly like and which I have particularly at heart, is that a pure Stanislavski or an authentic Stanislavski, a real Stanislavski, it's very difficult to speak in those terms anymore in this horizontal openness of Stanislavski mixing with other practitioners, okay, we don't, we cannot really speak anymore in these terms, especially in a 21st century context, which is concerned with what Richard Chapter refers to as the blurring of boundaries. Sometimes I like to joke with students that Stanislavski did not exist, but what existed were Stanislavskis, Stanislavskis in plural, the plurality of Stanislavski, which I am sure we all can celebrate. The second point arising from the essays is that Stanislavski remains helpful to get across the 21st century student. And sometimes I feel that a student type does not really exist anymore, especially when we consider the generation Z of students who have been born in the past 20 years or so, whose identities are becoming increasingly fluid and diverse. Of course, when we speak about diversity, the result of this is a need to develop a sense of inclusivity. And inclusivity becomes an essential consideration of 21st century pedagogies. But I would like to argue briefly that this inclusivity ultimately remains highly Stanislavskian at its core. 
perhaps the last Stanislavski, the last Stanislavski when instead of looking at psychological detail to get into the role, or instead of getting the actors to sit down around the table to go in depth in, a, in the, the textual analysis of a script, of a text, this is the Stanislavski who will tell his students, his actors, okay, situate yourself as Stefan, as Paul, as Eileen, with your own identity, with your own culture, with your own background, with your own skills, in the given circumstances of the role. And start from there. Start from yourself in the given circumstances of the role. The invitation this makes to teachers and pedagogues is to therefore look less for a degree, degree of ableness in students, a kind of correct physicality or a correct execution of instructions to search instead for a more individualized performance of tasks within one's physical, emotional, and technical abilities and backgrounds. This becomes this, the starting point to work on a role, one's own physical, emotion, emotional, technical abilities and backgrounds. Uh, the third point arising from the book is the adaptability of the system. And I feel, generally speaking, that it is because all the others privileged a sense of here and now, and the sensitivity to the pedagogical needs of the pedagogical needs in the studio or in the rehearsal room, because they privilege these, this here and now and these needs, the system could be adapted. They could adapt the system and they could adapt it to different contexts. And these contexts could be very different. These contexts could be as different as the Zoom frame during a global pandemic, or a university and or an institution with its own set of operatives, of bureaucratic oper operatives, or for example, adapting the system to the acting industry, or adapting the system to more exploratory uh, studio and laboratory work. My fourth point, my fourth and final point arising from the book is that scholarship about actor training and about actor pedagogy is extremely varied. And I feel that this is what really attracted me to the project. And again, I feel that this is a, a variety that we should celebrate, not curtail, that we should celebrate. In fact, the essay, the book features a history-based essay, an exercise-driven essay, an essay that moves from the particular to the general, an essay that marries theory with practice, and an altogether more ethnographical account. And, but what would I would love to see, especially with this book, is and hear of practitioners or teachers or scholars or students who would get the book in their hands, read a bit, go through the book and find points that interest them, go into the studio and try out some of the ideas in practice. I think this is uh, one of the main objectives of the whole series. And But to facilitate this adaptation and this going into the studio with some of the ideas inherent in the book, all essays then feature a number of exercises or suggestions for practice. And the idea here with these exercises and these suggestions for practice is to explore an idea or to explore a theme emerging in the essays. Readers are certainly invited to try out any of these exercises and to, to devise their own alternatives and developments. As I said, the main idea here is certainly on exploration. So I will stop the share and we can move on to the authors um, to submit, to present, to us their own intervention about their specific essay. Uh, we are going to go chronolo chronologically as by following the contents of the book. So I will start with John Gillett. I will read out John's um, uh, three-minute intervention. John. 
Stefan asked me to put forward my interpretation and practice of Stanislavski's approach, working with students and professionals. I will focus on three areas, relevance, practice, inclusivity. Point number one, relevance and use. In arts and entertainment world, often characterized by commercial thinking and a lot of unemployment, low pay and frustration, Stanislavski offers a comprehensive process that gives the performer security and freedom. Secondly, there are no equal alternatives to Stanislavski in terms of the range, detail, and usefulness to the actor of his process. One used across theater, TV, film, radio, opera, and dance. Not in Brecht, Brodowski, Demidov, or any of the Americans inspired by Stanislavski. Thirdly, as, Stanis as Stefan and Jonathan Pitches have revealed, Stanislavski's used the word over in many different countries and cultures and in many different ways. Point two, practice. All of Stanislavski's training elements, such as given circumstances, communion, responsiveness, and inner motive forces, all need to be absorbed into the rehearsal process. Voice and movement are not separate skills, but are physical means for embodying the imaginative experience created by these elements. Our analysis of text and research needs to draw on intuition and imagination. Feeling, so important for Stanislavski, has to emerge through the circumstances and conflicts in an imaginary present, rather than be squeezed from a record personal past. Point number three, inclusivity. If someone is racist, sexist, homophobic, that will come through their teaching of Stanislavski, or Vachtango, or singing, ballet, or even Albert Einstein's theory of relativity. Such people will not grasp the humanity and collectivity intrinsic to Stanislavski's approach. All his training elements relate to some experience human beings have in common. Despite differences of country, ethnicity or sexuality. All of us live in circumstances, interact and pursue wants and needs. What I emphasize to students and actors is that they don't have to become a straight white actor, to become Judy Dench or Ralph Fiennes before they can play Hamlet or Gertrude. In active analysis, we place ourselves with our specific identity, history, ethnicity, sexuality, and culture into the imaginary circumstances of the character and allow ourselves to transform in forming the character through our differences and not limited by an academic concept of exactly how people might have been in different times or different places. We create an imaginary, an imaginary living reality, not a dry and barren concept that can reinforce restrictive stereotypes. Given the awful world events we are experiencing now, Stanislavski's emphasis on our humanity and the best of our current natures, I believe, is more important than ever before. So that was John's statements. Uh, Julia, please, and Christopher, we can start with your presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. Um, I will start and, and then Christopher will uh, join me in, in a minute or so. Um, uh, kind of going to give a little bit of an introduction for this uh, for this uh, essay that we wrote. Uh, Christopher and I collaborated on 10, right, Christopher? 10 maybe productions. Uh, so Christopher is a, is a movement director, so I would direct and Christopher would uh, would be a choreographer, movement director on um, on a show. And so as we continued to work together in rehearsal, we began to realize that there's, there's uh, some sort of a dichotomy or chasm that we encounter when we work with students in rehearsal. Um, uh, we in our institution, uh, Stanislavski, the Stanislavski system is is uh, uh, sort of a primary uh, approach to teaching acting. 
Um, there are several um, acting teachers and acting coaches. Uh, they probably each have sli slightly different approach to teaching Stanislavski, but it's essentially Stanislavski-based acting school. And then we get students um, in rehearsal, and uh, we begin to realize that there, there's there's something that happens. They're unable to apply in some cases. Uh, they have challenge applying their um, the skills that they learn, and I'll, I'll use the word skills in this particular case, the training that they receive in their acting classes, they have trouble applying that training to the kinds of texts that, that Christopher and I direct. Uh, Nonlinear, um, abstract, image-based. Um, so there's, there's this uh, challenge or tension that we continue to encounter. Uh, in rehearsal spaces. And so that was that was the impetus uh, for writing this article. Uh, what we in in the article, what we what we do, there are two uh, case studies that we present. There are two different production processes. Um, one was on Bruno Schultz's The Strait of Crocodiles that took place pre-COVID pandemic. And then the, the second one is a little more recent. Uh, it's Polar Vogel's Indecent that we worked on in 20, actually during the pandemic, 2020, 2021. Both are nonlinear texts, both are abstract, um, both offer a, a sort of a multitude of perspectives to character. Uh, 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 in both cases, one actor would play multiple characters. And so then we, um, in this in this essay, we we contemplate uh, different ways that we uh, consider in rehearsal spaces in order to um, create what uh, Stefan called synthesis. Right, there's a synthesis, a synthetic approach that we're trying to um, create in order for our students to understand how they they can apply. Uh, the skills, the training they receive in acting classes to rehearsal spaces that explore nonlinear, abstract, image-driven, uh, devised work. Uh, Christopher, would you like to add anything to this? Yes, just to, sort of to jump in, my uh, attraction to this type of work, nonlinear, uh, more abstract, comes from the fact that the majority of my early career was spent as a concert dancer. Um, I did, had started out as an actor, so I had some familiarity with acting training and, and a Stanislavski-based uh, kind of thing. So when I came back to to uh, hone my skills and wind up teaching in a, in a university, I had that sort of uh, experience of trying to meld uh, the idea of those two things and how they would work together. Um, so I'm very, very interested in how students might be able to broaden their scope of, and I'll say it as well, skills to include things that can expand their imagination beyond what a simple analysis would be of what their characters should be. I think that's been kind of balanced in my experience with a lot of students come in uh, being compelled to come up with a type. Uh, how am I going to work in the industry? What am I going to, what can I sharpen to make myself a great package, uh, so to speak? Whereas I, I try to keep the, uh, the program functioning in a way that how can you expand what your perception of who you are and what choices you might make and what the space you inhabit is? Um, so yes, this, this uh, essay then goes into a couple of... Uh, exercises that start to move us away from, it's not just analysis, psychological awareness, et cetera, et cetera, but it also has to do with ideas of, for example, risk and safety, uh, rhythm, um, discovery, et, et cetera. So um, I am very happy with the way it, it turned out and uh, I'm hoping that it will propel us into further work. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, may I remind you that you can place questions and comments in the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of the screen. Um, Bella, please. Thank you so much. Uh, my chapter is called Framing Stanislavski Online Pedagogies in the Zoom Era. 
And it's set against the backdrop of the plunge into COVID lockdown in March 2020 that we all experienced and how we all had to suddenly invent modes of actor training and production work in this new digital Zoom environment. The chapter starts with James McLaughlin's invitation when we're addressing unconscious bias, and it's equally relevant in this digital situation. Don't be afraid to start from a position of ignorance and learn with the students. And as a complete technophobe, that's exactly what I was doing. The chapter covers three lines of practice-based inquiry into pedagogy. Part one is called launch meeting. And the main experiment was how to teach the fundamentals of Stanislavski's toolkit in the digital environment. And I used the underlying essence of Adrienne Marie Brown's emergent strategy, which in other words means let the events that in, unfurl in the Zoom classroom reveal the journey that we're going to take as a team of instructor and students. And the main tool that I used in this experiment was Stanislavski's six fundamental questions, who, where, when, why, for what reason, and how. The main experience I extrapolated from this experiment was how to be led by intuition as we all navigated the different sides of a remote classroom, how each person was suddenly center stage of their own screen whilst being part of the checkerboard of faces on everybody else's screen. And this was a literal dismantling of the regular uh, teacher and uh, student hierarchy. What you'll find in this section are thoughts on online psychophysical coordination, willing vulnerability, playfulness, and dynamic listening. The second part is called gallery view. And the main experiment that I was ex exploring was how can we use the digital pedagogical format of Zoom for training simultaneously for both the stage and the screen? The main tool I used was the given circumstances of frames and framing. The main experience I extrapolated from this experiment was how we read each other very differently in Zoom environments in terms of eyeline. Do we look at this little green blob, this little camera? Do we look at each other? And how does that affect our communication? What you'll find in this section are thoughts on the information that exists within each of our screens, each of our frames, and how to explore active analysis on Zoom with simple scores of physical actions and playing with the actual entering and exiting of the Zoom frame. Part three is called record meeting. And the main experiment was, could we incarnate some pedagogies of performance through the creation of a piece which we called 2020 Vision, which was a musical theatrical filmic hybrid created with the students at UC Riverside in spring 2021. And this is a screenshot behind me of one of the songs in the piece, which was called Zoom. The main tool I was exploring was could performance be used as well-being and community building during this remote COVID time, uh, particularly exploring what Stanislav Stanislavski called abshenia, community, communion. The main experience I extrapolated from this experiment was how to align each student's validation of sharing their experience of COVID through 16 autobiographical monologues that the, the cast wrote with the absolute precision of film editing of five songs, which were also part of this, um, this piece, sung in three-part harmony with seven actor singers who had never been in the same room together at the same time. What I hope you'll find in this section is how we all discovered our resilience, ingenuity, and the professionalism of the students and our incredible production team at UC Riverside, and how we really did let um, a pedagogical strategy emerge because we had never done anything like this before. Uh, the conclusion of the whole chapter is really, it behooves us to embrace digital pedagogies in our actor training because they're here to stay. They ain't going away. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Thank you, Bella. David? Thank you, Stefan, um, and thanks for this opportunity. Um, so this chapter really emerged out of um, the beginning of COVID, a, a brand new set of first year students arrived at the Western Australian Academy of Performing Arts, and I was teaching them some highly physical interactive exercises in a studio based environment to build relationship 
explore physical life, vocal life, etc. And then COVID hit and the entire school shut down and uh, the students moved all over Australia away from the school. And we had to find a way to continue some practical work um, um, that, that would uh, enable them to develop as actors rather than put everything into a theoretical space. Quite a lot of work was um, done theoretically, but we wanted to keep the practice alive. Um, I have worked um, for many, many years with Uta Hagen's object exercises, um, which had always been done in a live studio environment. But as a piece of research, it gave me an opportunity and the students the chance to explore the power of the object exercise, Uta Hagen's object, object exercise, delivered in what could be an authentic environment. So students for this exercise very briefly are asked to recreate 15 minutes of their own lives. They work from themselves in an environment that was very familiar to them. What this meant is that they could actually do the exercise in their own living rooms or bedrooms or kitchens, wherever they were, working as themselves in their home, creating a set of given circumstances. And, and the journey was very, very interesting for all of us because none of us had done it before. And the notion of doing this on a Zoom environment with everybody participating, but from within a Zoom environment, created a series of conditions that we found it quite difficult to negotiate sometimes and, and sometimes very, very enabling. In summary, the key things that this chapter really highlights are the notion of what is the notion of authenticity in Stanislavski in training? How does that shift in a Zoom environment all the time, as Stefan has referenced in his introduction, when the students are working from the notion of their own selves in their own environments? So what does that do to um, notions of authenticity? It also gives um, really interesting um, ideas about um, actuality, the actual space, as opposed to building a sense of theatrical truth. Are they the same? Is theatrical truthfulness the same as actuality? And 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 the um, I hope the chapter begins to unpack that quite a little bit. It also worked from Uta Hagen's um, descriptions, um, looks at the distinction between what she refers to as a naturalistic style, which is for her merely an imitation of everyday life, as distinct from building um, an artistic reality that is structured, edited, prepared with the scope of projecting something that's realistic as opposed to merely imitation or naturalistic. Um, at the center of all of this is the notion of the imagination. And I was interested that Christopher and Julia were talking about that in their chapter as well. What is the role of the uh, imagination of the performer and of the spectator in constructing a sense of belief? What, what, what is required to make belief in this environment? And how does the Zoom environment and working in my own space shift an actor's relationship to the imaginative processes that we would normally expect to be brought to bear on a studio environment. And finally, what is the role of the spectator in a studio environment? And if you look at Uta Hagen's um, original films of the object exercises, they actually take place in a studio environment in front of a class. Now, the same thing was happening in Zoom, but with Zoom, you're kind of in an isolated space, in fact, one of the things, one of the learnings was that students can switch off, they put up their names or their photographs, and we don't know what the quality of the viewing is like. So the net result was, it was for me, a really interesting piece of live research that myself and the students went on to find out about imagination, engagement, observing, participating, and um, editing, recreating. And there were loads of things that are highlighted in the chapter that we've learned, and also, some perhaps recommendations for people who are, who are interested in this kind of work going into the future. And as Bella says, it's here to stay. We're never going to get away from it. Um, and I think object exercises can still work on Zoom, but I would recommend some adjustments, which I talk about in the chapter. Thank you, David, for your intervention. So can I, can I have Eileen, please, for your statement? Yes, hello. Thank you, Stefan. Um, so my chapter is called Stanislavski Dances Argentine Tango. And it is a chapter in which I offer uh, exercises and actionable knowledge on co-actor connection. So the article came out of an ongoing um, research in co-performer connection. So let me contextualize that for a moment. Um, so co-performer connection for me is, um, is 
a hugely inspiring feeling. It's a feeling where you respond to another actor, a kind of responding that precedes all thinking or all decision making. It just happens. You can compare it to flow. Um, and besides the fact that it's a very pleasurable feeling, it it is also something that benefits the actual performance for me. So it is a state that is very known in the literature that not only Stanislavski, but also a lot of other practitioners have written about. Um, but what happened in my career uh, when I started as a jobbing actor in London and, you know, I started to have more and more free freelance jobs, became more professional, I started to lose this feeling. I, I just experienced it less often and this triggered me and there was no real answer to be found in the, the in the literature like there it's a very un, uh, ambiguous area what is literature and how to do it how to implement it as an actor around the same time I started dancing Argentine tango as a hobby in my free time and there it was bam night after night every time I went dancing there was this feeling of connection very strongly so this kind of um, this started for me a cross pollination process between Argentine tango and um, acting technique of how can I use um, uh, these things that I that I now find in Argentine tango and I how can I bring them to my acting process to bring that feeling back. Um, so it turned out to be a dialogue, um, as, as I progressed in this research, it, it very much turned out to be a dialogue between Stanislavski theory and, um, and, and tango, and I, I see the, the pedagogy, if you want, that I developed and that I now also teach um, as a, a refining and a retuning of, is, of Stanislavski's ideas on communion in conversation with experiences from Argentine tango dancing and ideas from philosophy as well. So the question I tackle in this article is how can we train actors to augment their ability to connect to other people? And of course, a big part of that, you might have thought if I talked about the difference between tango and the, and being a jobbing actor, well, it's very context dependent. Yeah? So the context is a, a huge influence on whether you know, an actor can feel connection or not. So that's one thing. But beside that, there is a small share where the actor has some agency. And that's where I focus on in this in this article. Um, and I tried to look, or I, I had to look beyond the actions. So beyond what does an actor do, I had to look at the transfer at certain transferable skills that enable um, uh, connection. So it, it might it might remind of Stanislavski uh, Stanislavski's creative state where he talks about you know you can work the soil but you cannot actually do the thing and 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 the the, the pedagogy I developed is very much about working the soil soil and kind of triggering this connection so in detail I uh, talk about four categories of transferable skills and um, the first one is about a healthy sense of self so it's about a real um, a, a verticality and um, you know I talk about verticality before horizontality is possible so you need, need to be anchored in who you are in what you are before any interaction is possible now a big thing um, you know that I come across as an acting tutor is um, the need to quieten the confining voice of interference so so you know the judging voice that a lot of actors but also especially like students have you know commenting on their selves so I offer some tools on that and how to maybe you know overcome or deal with that it's a very personal process obviously the second category of skill that I discuss is uh, sensing sensing in the moment and this is very much about also Stanislavski's quote where he says one can look at something and see it or one can look at something and not see it so there I propose that we don't need to we don't necessarily need to look better we need to let it come in more so so uh, you know when we train the senses you can I did train the actual sense, but I think what's needed is the effect it has on us. So there I offer some exercises as well, like noticing beauty and also um, exercises on responding, which I suggest is a more passive um, thing than we think it is. 
Uh, the third category of skill that I discuss is about meeting the other. Uh, it is about seeing the potential in difference and listening with an awareness of otherness. So the other is different than us. And I also offer some exercises, mainly touch-based exercises, um, because I believe that from the categories of skills, this is the one that can be practiced very concretely. Um, and then the last category of skills that I um, discuss is about the willingness to serve the whole, the bigger context. And obviously, like in the world that we live in, that is very focused on the individual. I think this is becoming an increasingly different difficult thing for many actors and acting students to do, you know, to um, bring about the intentionality that is needed in joint action. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, Mario will present the final intervention of the evening, please. Um, thanks, Stefan. Okay, so in this collection of essays, I contribute, as you can see, with a chapter on Stanislavski's work on opera. Now, there is an overwhelming amount of material to look at when it comes to Stanislavski's work on opera. Seriously, I, 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 I never expected that I'm going to um, dig into something of this sort when I started working on this, just to put you a bit in the context from his first staging of his first full opera in 1922 until his death in 1938, Stanislavski worked on at least one opera a year, at least. So for the sake of focus in this essay, I decided finally, after discussions with Stefan also as editor, to deal with one opera, the first one, Tchaikovsky's Eugenie Onyegin, um, which Stanislavski staged in, in 22, and one pedagogical element, the concept of the musical dramatic text. So uh, this concept of the musical dramatic text, as Stanislavski often underlined with his students, is a complex, uh, a complex textual conception, which is unique to opera or mu um, other forms of music theater similar to opera. And it is a key element when dealing with his work on the genre. Now in the essay, what I do is discuss the concept critically, but also provide examples by means of direct references to the score of Onyegin, which of course is the uh, dramatic text. I'm not going to go into details here clearly, but what I should would like to underline for the scope of, of the book is the broad pedagogical vision which Stanislavski um, was launching with his work on Onyegin. Uh, Stanislavski was not limiting himself to giving direct instructions for specific situations, rather he was deliberately working on develop, developing what in the essay I call key pedagogical considerations that actor singers could apply when working on any situation in any opera. So Onyegin was, like all the other operas he worked on, an experimental laboratory process, if we want, with which he could tackle challenges related to the craft of the actor singer the actor singer now one of the things that i hope emerges out of my contribution is the relevance more than anything else of this pedagogical vision and um, uh, dmitry bertman one of the directors opera directors that i interviewed while working on the essay gives in my opinion a very good articulation of this relevance when he says when he told me that while other opera directors often complain about the weaknesses of singers on stage, Stanislavski, instead of complaining, did something about it by providing singers with solutions. Solutions that work through long term commitment by the actor singer rather than superficial one off instructions by a director of how to deal with that specific situation. 
This is essentially the broadness of what I try to underline constantly in the essay. Of course, probably we've been acknowledging the work that Stanislavski has done on opera, but in my opinion, acknowledging is important, but not enough uh, for the sake of broadening further our understanding of Stanislavski's work. work. I think it is worth investigating critically and practically his, a bit more his contributions to the opera stage. I like quoting this line in Stanislavski when in My Life and Art he claims that music and singing would help him find his way out of the blind alley into which his research has led him, had led him. Now, I don't think he was just nodding at that famous narrator, Stanislavski here, who halfway through his life found himself lost in a selva oscura. I think um, Stanislavski here was not being met metaphorical when he's speaking about music um, um, and singing. I think Stanislavski was being most um, factual. M music and his work on opera provided a platform for Stanislavski to tackle some of the challenging issues he was encountering in the process of developing a system for actors to perform. In fact, I conclude the essay by proposing that Stanislavski's pedagogical vision for opera may shed interesting light on the way we appraise further the work on the craft the work on the craft of acting and the dynamics of the stage. And like Zoom, opera is here to stay. So <laughs> let us <laughs> dig deeper because Stanislavski uh, gave us a real lot there. And it's worth digging deeper into it, in my opinion, at least. Thanks, Stefan. Thank you, Mario. And thank you to all the authors. It's lovely to hear a synthesis of the essays, a summary of the essays. You know, sometimes as an editor, you have a point when you start you know, look, making sure that everything fits together in the context of the book as a whole. But uh, reliving the uh, main points of the essays makes me really want to go back and read the essays as a reader, almost now, rather than as an editor. So thank you very much for your inputs. Uh, you might have seen me taking down notes because I have received some questions which I would like to synthesize. I think I can synthesize the questions uh, in three. Uh, please, uh, attendees, if you have any other questions, feel free to forward them even in this final 10 to 15 minutes when we get to your questions, when we get to these answers. Uh, so as I said, I will try to synthesize the questions as much as I can. So for instance, um, there is a question for David and Bella on something which they, um, they mentioned and which is almost becoming like a, a little slogan for this session, the idea of here to stay, as Mario mentioned it as, as well. So um, somebody asked, are you keeping some of the Stanislavski online adaptations that you have attempted? Are you keeping some of that? Have you kept some of it this year? And have students asked for it once we returned back to the studios from your experience? Did students ask for any online work? I don't know who would like to go first. I'm happy to go first, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so well, first of all, um, I think perhaps in common with a lot of a lot of schools, the um, initial response to Zoom was to move a lot of the practical work online, which we did and um, very effectively um, and very creatively. Um, and then there was a sort of knee-jerk reaction when we were able to come back into the studio. People sort of dropped the online stuff and they moved back in. They felt so relieved to be together in, an, in, a, in a sense of community in a space that people forgot um, all the learnings of the online space within the school now we there there have been some developments in music theater for example in music training and in some parts of our acting course where we have now reverted and gone back to online delivery for certain um 
uh, aspects of practical work. Um, and it's very interesting because one of the things that Bella was talking about, looking at the space between theatrical performance and film performance is now very much um, shaping itself up as a way of thinking about actor training within on the acting course at, at WAPA. Um, but also some of the work that we did, and which has been published on music theatre by one of my colleagues, Nicole Stinton, has now developed um, a different way of thinking about how we might deliver pedagogies that are online. A lot of it has removed back, gone back to a kind of live um, teaching situation within a studio, but some of it is still online. Students, what was really interesting about the group that I had is, and one, one of the things I talk about in the chapter is, they were a bit confused. And I think that was because we were all a bit confused because we expected it to work really smoothly online, which isn't to say that it didn't work smoothly online, but they were coming to it, as somebody has said, as Generation Z, they're very familiar, they're very at ease on camera. So it was what they, things that they took for granted need to be exposed a little bit more within the context of moving theatrical work to an online environment. But as a school, we've learned a huge amount from it, from working online, and we're going to continue doing that going forward. Uh, thank you, David. Was your experience similar, Bella? So, uh, like uh, David saying, I'm in a department that is theatre, film and digital production. So uh, since we changed from being simply theatre to theatre, film and digital production, in all my acting classes, I've tried to find ways of uh, blurring the boundaries, to use your phrase from earlier. So in many ways, the, the Zoom environment is really helpful for encouraging students to understand how the tools that we've explored in person uh, in uh, co-performer connectivity, um, how then we hold on to that when we're in the Zoom environment, because so many auditions happen on Zoom these days. So I hold the, um, the students, I can't actually say they've asked for it. Um, however, uh, in my 10 week course at the moment, there are two weeks where I consciously go on Zoom. One is actually to do text analysis. If I want to show them a piece of text close up and I don't want them, if I, I say, okay, right, we're gonna do a first reading, read the scene, all right, what are your gut reactions? I don't want them to have access to the script after that while they then go into their gut reactions. So if I've got it on a shared Zoom screen, I can then go back to these boxes and ask them, well, what did you feel? What did you sense? Da, da, da. Then I can bring the script back up. If I either had it on, I could have it on a projector, I suppose, in the, in the classroom, or we'd have paper copies. So actually there's something about this, this um, under distancing that Zoom gives us that draws us very deeply into the text analysis. They are, they are literally close to the text. So therefore there's a kind of go, getting inside their heads of how their imagination is vibing with the text. So I do that. I also do some fundamental active analysis on Zoom, as I mentioned in the chapter. Again, so that they can understand the in and out of the, the frames. The other way that I have hung on to um, uh, the Zoom environment is, is, of course, doing international workshops. It means you can have people like here and now, we can have people doing actor training workshops all together across the world, but also my alumni, and I should just sort of show them my group here, you know, if the whole group of alumni want to all get together, but they're all over the world and they're all doing whatever, we could, in effect, fix up an actor training, we could go through um, audition monologues, we could just do some stuff. I haven't done a huge amount of that yet, but that is certainly where I'd want to go. So watch, much as it was a panic going online, and I thought, I just don't know how we're going to do this. I've actually now come to quite love it, as long as it's in dialogue with the live environment mm -hmm. as well. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Bella. Thank you, David. Another question that I have is uh, to Julia and Chris. And the question basically is asking you to expand a little bit on your idea of uh, a pedagogy within the context of a performance. So basically uh, the question is that, have you ever considered a performance project, which yes, it is a performance. It leads to a final presentation, a final performance. But then it is also underpinned by some technical uh, consideration, like for example, yes, we are working on a production, but this production is an exercise in rhythm, for example, or an exercise in developing group dynamics, for instance. Have you ever considered like this this approach or this thinking? 
Julia, perhaps? Yeah, I, I can start and then maybe uh, Christopher, yes. Uh, so this is something that is happening right now in the moment. Uh, we are um, working on Mary Zimmerman's uh, Metamorphoses, which is a, a devised piece that uh, Zimmerman created about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, based on Ovid's myth. Um, so that was devised initially, and uh, there's a text, there's existing text, and we we are we're redevising in a way this work. And uh, um, going back to uh, to the question, uh, Stefan, so the technique that we're exploring in this particular uh, <clears throat> rehearsal space, we work with um, the two aspects. Uh, one is um, image work, uh, how we um, uh, um, extrapolate images from, from the given myth, uh, and then uh, collectively, um, uh, as an ensemble, we uh, create those images on stage, uh, thinking particularly about a tempo rhythm um, of each image uh, uh, in duration, um, and then also how each image relates to uh, to a particular environment, whether that's an environment created for us by scenographers or the environment that the image itself um, uh, presents, like a, a tree, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of tree imagery we create. So um, so even though we're working on a production, yes, with certain technical aspects that we are exploring in rehearsal. Uh, Christopher? Yeah, and I feel it's most effective when people sort of let loose and let go of their grasp on the pre-existing text and really start exploring when we're working at how rhythms uh, can play out and whatnot and how the images can change during their playing around and, and uh, working with that. Um, I think that's the strongest part of it. And that's a bit of, bit of a challenge um, when you, or it's been my experience when you first get a group together uh, to do this kind of conceptualization that at times our first thought is, well, how are we going to physically do the same thing we do when we're at the table? I think it's more effective when that's sort of a balance between the two, that we have table work, we, we, we can intellectualize to that degree, but at the same time, we can get up and just let things go and see where our instincts are going, going to uh, come to play. Thank you both, Christopher. Thank you, Julia. Uh, the final question I would like to pose is both to Mario and Eileen because it's very similar. Um, I have two questions about expansion. So basically, somebody is asking Mario whether you are planning to expand to develop this further, this study further beyond Oregon, and it's something that you have hinted at. And Eileen, um, the question that I have is that if perhaps you are thinking of applying some of your findings to for community building, like in community-based projects, rather, for example, with professional actors. So both of them are questions about looking beyond, like expansion of your studies. I don't know, uh, Mario, if you would like to go first. Yes, definitely. Um, uh... Actually, that was the plan for my current sabbatical. Then, of course, uh, it was disrupted by the ongoing war in Russia, uh, in, in Ukraine, <clears throat> because, of course, there, there is material which one has to look at. Uh, although, at the moment, I'm trying to plan uh, a way around this, because uh, um, it's a bit... There is a, an element of historical research which needs to be done because, of course, this is a territory that almost demands it in a way. Uh, also, because it is it is not very much addressed, let's say in the Anglo English speaking world, because in Russia, Stanislavski and Dobera are the most obvious thing that you can speak about. Uh, then, of course. Um, we have some material that we can build on and um, one of the reasons why i decided to continue working on this was because as i said uh, in the beginning of my brief intervention there's so much material um 
that I mean, when you think that for this essay, I only covered 13 measures of music, actually not the whole opera, 13 measures of music, which I also show in the in the uh, text, are like the equivalent of three lines of text in a dramatic text. And only those were enough to develop all this uh, critical evaluation and also be able to suggest some practical tips. So yes, the plan is that. To continue, yes, that's, that's definitely, and going through the operas that we know that he uh, directed also. I would love to have this discussion, of course, in the next Whenever couple of years. Whenever weeks. you want. Yes. Eileen, please. Yes. Um, yeah, so, uh, um, as, you know, it, it happens that I'm at the moment, I'm actually developing a project which is very, very community based, which um, fuses professional performers with uh, community work and building community is a very important um, uh, goal in that project. So uh, in six months time, I know whether the Belgian government wants to fund it or not. So fingers crossed on that. But I. I would go even further, like um, I'm also working with a colleague at the University of Amsterdam on introducing these exercises in um, in the business world, um, you know, more connection. I'm interested in more connection, like overall. And it is something um, it is something that some businesses are really interested in, like how to increase connection to get our employers more happy and more involved in the work and yield better results so um, i'm looking into that too but you know the, 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 it goes in a parallel way because I, I still see the benefits when i work you know when i myself now do experience more uh, a connection when i'm performing or when i see uh, stu the students i work with um, at the vocational school that i school that i teach when I see them grow in their performance, just because they add a layer of connection, you know, I wouldn't want to lose uh, that dimension of, of working with uh, professionals. Um, thank you, Eileen. Uh, I think we have covered all the questions that we have received. I'm just going to pause a few seconds in case there's one final question coming in. So, it only remains for me to thank you, okay, to thank you for, to thank the authors, first and foremost, for your essays, for your contribution to the projects. I would like to thank um, Paul for steering the whole series as a whole, and Jonathan for his mentoring and for his um, uh, um, steering also the Stanislavski Research Center, and the attendees for attending, of course, this the webinar and for your questions. So. May I all bid you a good evening or a good day or a good night, depending where we are. And thank you for attending and for your participation. Thank you.